the book of St. Mark, chapter number 2. We'll read some scripture there this evening, and um, maybe it's got some mid on it, brother, that needs to go down or high one. Uh, Mark, the number 2. Let's look at some scripture here this, this evening. I've heard Doc, Dr. Jack Howell say many, many times, the answer to any church problem is soul winning. The answer to any personal problem is soul winning. And when you think about, when you think about it, what's God more interested in than anything in the world? People, right? Now, He's not here, the Lord's not here in person. We are here in Christ's stead, the Bible says. So we're, we believe that if we will get busy and stay after what God's interested in, then God's able to work out what's wrong in our lives. Got marriage problems, financial problems, having a hard time getting, getting, getting things going right, you like your marriage, whatever. I tell you, the best thing you can do, get your heart right and go get somebody else to church and to God. You'll do that. The Lord will say, okay, you're doing what I care about. Now, I'm going to fix what you care about. It's the work. And so, tonight, we see this story here in Mark chapter 2, and I want you to look at verse number 1. Mark chapter 2. Y'all too hot? Flip it on back there, fellas, for, my, uh, for a few minutes, if you, if you will. Mark chapter number 2, uh, beginning with verse 1. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. Best advertisement you can get. Best advertisement a church can have is word to get out that Jesus is in the house. And straightway, many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. That's the way we want it. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemy? Who can forgive sins? but God only. And immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason you these things in your heart? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed, and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, and took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. You'd like to see that, wouldn't you? Wouldn't it be nice where everybody would say, I've never seen it like this. I want to preach tonight on the subject, Bringing Men to Jesus. One of the greatest blessings of life after you get saved is to be personally involved and bring somebody else to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible said in Matthew 28, we're to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. 2 Corinthians 5.18, God hath reconciled us to Himself and given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. We pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. The answer to church problems tonight is getting men to Jesus Christ. Uh, God commanded us to straighten out everything. God commanded us to get people to God. So tonight, I, I know some preachers, they feel like it's their job to police everybody in, their, in the whole world, but uh, it, it can't be done. Our job is to get men to Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to tell you a story tonight, and it won't be too long, so you listen carefully. This story goes like this. There was a house of people one time, and this house was full of people. It was not 
able. There wasn't even anybody else in. It's packed full. Standing around like this. They didn't have church buildings in the New Testament. So they, they met in houses. And so this house was completely packed full. The Lord was in here uh, getting ready to preach. And the story centers around four men who brought another man to Jesus. Now, what they done is they found this guy and he's sick of the palsy. He's all grown up like this, like, like a cripple. He could not walk. And he, he, was, he was laying in the bed. And these four men brought that one man to the Lord and the Lord heals him. That's a picture tonight of you and I getting men to Jesus out here in the world. People you work with, people you go to school with, your, your family, your friends, relatives, people like that, getting them people to God. So tonight, let's just, uh, let's just think about this story tonight. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to break it down, and we're going to use these four men as a picture. Now, everybody here works with people that you could get to come to church uh, start next Sunday morning. Ever, all you kids, you go to school with people. If you try hard enough, you can get somebody to come to church next Sunday and the next Sunday during our fall program. I'm going to use this message tonight and try to encourage us to get a lot of in here in, in our fall Sunday school campaign starting next Sunday morning. Now, we need, uh, we need a uh, sick man. We need a, a sick man. And uh, Okay, you're the sick man. I found that out this morning, didn't we? All right. Here, here we are, right here's your bed. Uh, you lay on this bed right here. Lay down there, and you do exactly what I tell you. All right. All right. This man is sick. He cannot come to church. He just can't make it. He's sick of the palsy. His hands are drawn up. His, his feet, he can't walk. I mean, there's a lot of people like that. He cannot come to the Lord on his own. He can't do it. He can't do it. Here's the Lord over here. The place is packed full, and he can't come. Because he's just not able. That is a picture of every man that's in sin tonight. That man cannot come to God on his own. How can they hear except by somebody else tell? Listen, there's people here this morning, there's 143 of them here this morning that would have never come to church had not somebody took a bus and rolled up in front of their house and got them. I want to preach to every bus worker. How many of you here this, morning, this evening was out on the bus route yesterday? Would you raise your hand, please? If you was out visiting the bus route yesterday, raise your hand. All right, let me talk to you all tonight. And then let me talk to the rest of you, that all, the rest of you that ought to be out there this weekend. Amen. And should be. Listen to me tonight. This man can't get to God. Them bus kids can't get to God unless somebody goes and brings them. How shall they hear except somebody preaches them? How shall they, how shall they uh, uh, come unless somebody brings them? And bus kids are pictured by, by this man. Now, he's laying here and he can't get to God. So, we're going to have four men bring him to God. All right? Uh, Bobby, I want you to stand on one corner. Uh, Brother Jason, you're on the other corner. Jeremy, you're on the other corner. Brother Ray, you're right there on that corner. Now, these four men are going to bring this man to God. This man right here, he could bring him to God all by himself. <laughs> he could too. He could too. Amen. All right. Now, they're going to bring. This man, was well, he couldn't come on his own. Here's the Lord in here preaching, and he can't come on his own. Bible said they brought him. He was born of four. So each one of them got the corner of that bed, and boy, here they come with it, and they brought him to the Lord. Now, you fellas sit down there just a minute. We're going to introduce you to everybody here tonight, and I'm going to tell you who these men were that brought that man to God. The first man came along down one day. We'll let that be you, Jeremy. You come over here. He was coming down the road like this, and he's coming down the road like this. He said, I'm going to go hear Jesus preach. Got my tape in, got my CD in. Everybody will be happy. Woo! Boy, I got to sing in the choir morning. Brother Danny said, Don't be late. Uh, I'll, I'll be there. I got to go. And he looked, and oh my goodness. He looked, and there he was. And you know what? When he looked at him, his heart just broke. And he thought, Lord, have mercy. That boy can't make it on his own. You know what? I'm going to name him this see That man right there, I'm going to name him compassion. And compassion looked down at that boy and his heart broke. 
I will tell you something. His heart went out for him. His heart went out for him, people. His heart broke for that guy. And I will tell you tonight, we are, churches are way lacking in compassion tonight. The average church member tonight... Oh, listen to me. The average church member tonight could not give a big hoot whether anybody gets saved or not in their Sunday morning services. Makes no difference. Whether, and you know it and I know it. Most people get more tore up. If somebody put a scratch on their car in the parking lot, they'd get tore all to pieces. But a lost person can walk around the service lost without God and it don't bother us one bit. Our priorities are out of But if people's going to hell, we ought to care about them. Them people on our bus route, they're going to hell. Mamas and daddies are going to hell. Teenagers are going to hell. They're going to burn. They're going to fry like a piece of beef, meat in a pan. They're going to burn. Somebody needs to kill them. We're going to find out. We'll find out Saturday morning if you care. We'll find out during the Sunday school campaign if you care. A lot of people say, oh, I care, preacher. But buddy, you ought to put legs on your carrot. We'll put legs on them. We ought to get out here and knock on some doors and have some passion. Amen. Compassion's heart broke. He said, Lord, have mercy. I feel so sorry for that guy. I wish there was something I could do for him. I wish I could help him. He, he's, he's, he, it just kills me to see him in that shape. I'm going to tell you something tonight. You're never going to get nobody saved until you start caring about them. You're never going to win nobody to God until you get up and you think, Lord, I care about my neighbor. Lord, I know he's mean as the devil and he shot my dog and all that, but I care about him. Lord, I care about that man that lives the road. I care about that bus parent that run me off one day. I care about uh, that teenage girl uh, who's rebelling against her parents. I care about that old drunk that lives up there in the trailer park on the hill. God, I care about him. That's something. Do you care about people? Do you care about anybody? Does it even bother you that your own neighbor might be going to hell? He had compassion. And compassion looked at him and he said, Good night. I can't stand it. I can't stand it. Well, you're going to be late. I can't help it. I, I can't stand to see a man in a shape like that. And then there was a second man came up. You see, compassion couldn't get him there by himself. The Bible said it took four of them to get him there. So, uh, this next man, uh, I'm going to call him Faith. I'm going to call him Faith. Well, Jake, he comes right here. And compassion looks over at Faith, and he says, Will you help me? So Faith stands up, and he said, Sure, I will. Now we got two, and we're going to get this man to Jesus. This man's name is Faith. This man's name is Compassion. Now, what, faith does, what does faith do? Compassion said, look, he's breaking my heart. I can't, I can't stand to see him in this shape. Faith steps up and says, I believe Jesus can help that man. You see, amen, it takes more than just feeling sorry for people. It's more than just your heart going out to people. We've got to believe that God is able to change somebody's life. Listen, if you have knew me before I got saved, you'd have said, there ain't no way in the world he'd ever get saved. If you'd have knew me, you'd have said, no, I'm... Listen, if you took all the kids in high school, my high school graduating class, and stand them up and said, which one of them is going to be a preacher? They would have never picked me. I'm telling you, you think I'm hyper now? You ought to see me when I was 16. I ain't 17. Good night. I'd have been all over this place. I, 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 I thought, I thought I was bad sick if I didn't play ball four hours a day. And then we'd run the roads all night. I used to go all over Nebo, bounce a basketball between my legs like this all night long. All night. Till daylight. I mean, we was crazy. And a bunch of boys, we called it camping out. <laughs> we told our parents we was camping out. And we, we'd go around, and we almost got run up, lay down in the middle of the road, you know, just act stupid. And, you know, uh, hit people's mailboxes with bottles. We used to go down the road, and we'd go get a carton of bottles down to the store. And that was a sport after dark sport. Uh, where you'd hang out in the, you know, and see if you could throw it. There. Or, better yet, it's more fun when you're on this side of the road, and the sign on that side, and you do a left hook like that and hit the stop sign. Man, that's hard to do. And don't ever do that. Uh, but, uh, but boy, when you hear that thing go, bang, it, it's pretty neat. Uh, and, and, boy, I tell you what, uh, we used to do that all the time. And if you stood all them kids up, you'd have said, which one of them is going to be a preacher? They would have never picked me. I promise you, they'd have never picked me. But I'm glad somebody believed. I'm glad somebody cared. I'm glad somebody said, Danny, you can get saved. And I did get saved. Now, listen, there's a lot of other little fellas out there like me. There's a lot of other 
people out there like him. They cannot come. They must be brought. They cannot learn. They must be taught. Some churches will get a burden for them. Listen to me. Can I tell you something tonight? We're never going to be in the big shot churches. They're never going to have me to speak at the ministerial assassination. Thank God. I, I, I'm never going to be invited. Can you turn me up just a little bit, brother? They're never going to invite me to go to them things like that. Hallelujah. That's all right if they don't. But I'll tell you what we can do. We can beat these bushes and go to these trailer parks and go to these uh, apartment complexes where there's little boys and little girls and mamas and daddies in there and say there's hope. There's hope. And we can believe God will get a hold of us. How many of you in here tonight has a neighbor or a friend or somebody you work with or somebody in your family it's not saved. Raise your hand. It's about everybody in here. Let me tell you something. You believe God. And you believe God. And you believe God. You're able. God, you're able. Faith says, I believe Jesus can help him. So, faith looks up and he says, I believe the Lord can help him. Compassion says, he's breaking my heart. And the third man comes up. Brother Ray, you come up. And Brother Ray comes up. And faith and compassion's talking. And faith and compassion say, Man, I wish I could help him. And faith said, I believe the Lord will smack you if you don't don't you make another move. You're invalid. Uh, listen, listen. Faith says, I believe God the Lord help him. And you know what the next guy gets up? Anybody, listen, I bet you can guess his name. You can believe till you're blue in the face and it won't save him. You can feel sorry for him all day long and it won't help him. What does the Bible say? Faith without is dead. His name is works. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight, there is no substitute in the work of God. You will not build a bus route. You will not build a Sunday school class. There is no other way than just old-fashioned rolling up the sleeves, getting out there and getting after it and getting the job done for the glory of God. Work at it. Work at it. I put in some hours a week. I put in some long hours. I told somebody the other day, I said, now I'm taking on an extra job. I already got two full-time jobs. I'm a full-time pastor, and I'm just about a full-time evangelist, and now we're starting a building program. And a building program takes up a tremendous amount of time. We've got to be making a lot of decisions a week. They'll be calling us tomorrow about some things from Duke Power. I'm working with the building inspectors. All that stuff. Spent a lot of time down there at the new building. It can't happen unless somebody works. It takes work, brother. We was down there Monday. Got there about 8 o'clock Monday morning. 15 till 8, matter of fact. Left there at almost dark Monday night. That ain't going to kill you. It's good to work. It's good to work. Listen, you see this building here tonight? When we first come in here, these lights was flat. Them beams was red. There was no carpet in here. And there was no beautiful multicultural chairs in, in here tonight uh, to make everyone feel welcome. And brother, I'll tell you something this, this evening. All this stuff, this took work. Work. Let's work, brother. We worked and put our money together. How many of you was here with us that very first Sunday morning? Raise your hand. Very first Sunday morning in July of 2000. Amen. Well, you know what this little group done? We got together. We put our money together. We worked. We painted. We done everything. And bang! Out comes Shining Light Baptist Church. Listen, works. God said we got works has something to do with it. I know I, I'm a grace preacher. I believe we're saved by grace. We're going to heaven by grace. But we ought to work like dogs for the glory of God for what God has done for us. Let me ask you something. Has God been good to us? Has the Lord been good to us? Listen, we ought to get out there this coming city and beat our knuckles off and say hallelujah. I'm going to try to get somebody to God. Some of you that's never been on bus route ought to come and go this Saturday. I'm going. You go with me. We'll go knock on some doors. You go with these fellows. They'll go knock on some doors. You go with these fellows. We'll go knock on some doors. Hey, man, we'll work. Work says, I tell you what we're going to do, boys. He said, I, he said, you feel sorry for him. Yep. You believe Jesus can help him, right? Yep. He said, all right. Well, the only way we're going to, the only way, only we're going to help this boy is work. Now, roll your sleeves up. And he done like this, you know. And boy, they started going like cats. And they start saying, that's the only way we're going to help him. He said, I, I, one of you grab one leg, one grab the other leg, one, or the corner of his bed. And work said, let's go after it. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight, there is no substitute for hard work. Somebody said, success 
You look at anybody that's success in business. You look at anybody that's a success in sports. They work at it. They work at it. Them professional athletes, basketball, baseball, uh, football, they work at it, buddy. They work at it. You know, them movie stars in Hollywood, we preach about them how wicked they are, and they are wicked. But I'll tell you one thing, them people work their rear off. I mean, they, when there's them sets and some of them have to starve their self, lift weights and everything else, they work at it. They work at it. You know what's wrong with a lot of people in God's house? They're so lazy. They will not hit a lick for God. We, we, listen, we ought to make up our mind. Let's have a prayer meeting Saturday night and get in here and lay on this altar and work a while and work a while and pray and labor and miss some sleep and miss some food and work and work and work till we see God. How many of you would like to see your neighbor hit the altar? How many of you like to see your brother or your sister come streaming down the altar like this, down the aisle, wiping tears? Listen, it can happen if compassion and help, uh, feel sorry for them. If faith believes God can help them, and if work said, well, let's go to their house and knock on their door and tell them what's going on in the house of God. People don't know. We've got to tell them. We've got to go and put some works along with our prayers. Amen? So, they say, all right, boys. If we're going to get this man to Jesus, let's get after it. So come on, Bob. You come on up here. And they say, you grab one in. You grab the other, you grab the other, you grab the other. Now they're going to pick him up and take him to Jesus. Just act like you are. And they're going to pick him up and take him to Jesus. This man don't have policy. He's retarded. And then, so uh, so uh, we're going to pick him up and bring him to Jesus. We're going to pick him up and bring him to Jesus. Now I'm not going to take his name yet. Alright. Now we don't know how far they had to go. But each one got a corner of that bed. And here they went. I can imagine somebody coming by in their little hot rod. Who's them idiots carrying that man? i got to hurry. I'm going to be late. Here, Jesus. Somebody else come by. Here come the Pharisees by. The deacons came by. The Sunday teachers came by. The big shot reverend from downtown came by. You know what they did? They passed by on the other side. They wouldn't even go near a low life like that, you know. They didn't want to be associated with people like that. Uh, you better watch out for churches that everybody's a big shot, you know, and, and you know, these highfalutin. Uh, you better watch out for a crowd like that. You, you better stay away from that bunch. And so they got this man, and they begin to walk. And they walked. 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 It was hard. It had been a whole lot easier. Listen to me. It would have been a whole lot easier just for them to walk over and say, I'm going to go hear the Lord preach today and sit down. But they carried this man. And folks, tonight, if anybody's going to get saved, if anybody's going to get saved in our fall program, if we want to see soul walk down at our church, we're going to have to literally get under the burden and carry them. Mr. T, what time did you leave your house this morning? 8.30. But Mike, what time did you leave? 7.30 this morning. So he's got a pacemaker. Blind and eye, deaf in one ear. And some of y'all couldn't even get here until 11. And he left his house at 7.30. You say, that makes me feel bad. Yes, you should feel bad. You should feel bad. You're, they're bringing this man to God. They're bringing him to God. man left his house at 7.30 this morning, and some of y'all couldn't make it to Sunday school, and was late for the preaching service. I've seen people come in here at 25 till 12. Get up, take a shower, get dressed, get in there at 25 or 12 and it's over at 12, and go back home. Now, you get an E for effort, but Lord have mercy. I mean, how lazy can people get? Boy, it's getting quiet in here tonight. It is not my fault. <laughs> don't you get mad at me for something you do. Somebody said, well, Brother Danny, you kind of hurt my feelings. Look, don't get mad at me. I didn't do it. That's like a woman getting mad and smashing her mirror because it shows the wrinkles in her face. <laughs> it ain't my fault you ain't get, get up. Get up, man. Get up. Uh, get up. Get out of bed. 
And brother, give that man, give him God. Everybody in here ought to take a ride on one of these buses during one of these weeks on this fall Sunday school campaign. Really, you should. And I know everybody, God don't want everybody in the bus ministry. I know some people's got to pay for it, and some people, I understand that. Some people have a special gift and a calling for it, I understand that. But everybody here, get on one of these buses, and you bus workers, it's your, it's your job, can recruit them. Make everybody in here ride your bus one Sunday morning. Let them see, let them see where these kids come from. Let them see the homes they live in. Let them see the situation they come out of. Let them see the hell got to go back into. Brother, it'll take some work to get people to God. So we got compassion, faith, works. They said, let's get him. So they pick him up and they start walking. They walk, they walk, and they walk. And guess what? They get over to the house and the deacons are standing out front smoking. And they say, Where are you fellas going with that guy? They said, We're trying to get him in here to hear Jesus pray. He said, Oh, you'll never get him in there. You'll never get that guy in there. It's packed out. We can't even get in. We're, we're big shots. We're deacons here. We can't even get in. Now, what's that show? That shows that every time you try to do something for God, and you really try to get something done for God, there's always some religious backslid character going to pour cold water on you and discourage you. Again. How many of you bus workers have been out on your bus and there'll be somebody out there saying, you can't help these people. There ain't no hope for this riffraff, you know. Uh, they, uh, ain't no use trying to get these. You're wasting your money. Gas is nearly $3 a gallon. Oh, by the way, I knew people a few months ago couldn't come to church because gas got so high. Now it's cheaper than it was a year ago and they still ain't coming. thought I'd throw that in there. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, listen, boy, uh, they got him in there. They got him over there. They got him over there. And the deacon said, you can't get him in. That's the way you know you're getting it close. When you're getting somebody close, that's when you get cold water poured on you. That's when somebody try to discourage you. When you about get them to God, that's when your family will say, there ain't no hope for him. He's been drinking 30 years. There ain't no hope for that old wicked sinner. And they'll try to discourage you. That's the way you know the devil's trying to stop you. So they got him in here and, uh, and, and compassion went. And faith's faith went. I reckon we've lost it. And work said, all this work for nothing. And compassion said, all I know to do is we might as well take him back. I guess we've done all this for nothing. And faith said, well, I thought it'd work, but I guess you're right. And they started to turn and leave until that fourth man stepped up. You know what I'm going to call his name? Determination. Determination. That's what we need. But if God ought to put a dose of determination down in our soul, that we are not going to quit, we are not going to give up, as long as we've got a lost neighbor, a lost loved one, our bus sitting full, or we are, we're not going to let the devil discourage us. And determination said, hold it right here, boys. We've come too far to turn back now. Amen. Woo! Hallelujah. And old determination says, hold it right here. And he runs over here and he goes into a barn. And in this barn, next thing you know, he comes out with a ladder and he's got a rope around his shoulder. And he comes out like this and the deacons are going like this. What's he doing here? What, uh, what are you doing, young man? Uh, uh, respect for the house of God. Uh, what are you doing bringing those gimmicks in here like that? And boy, he takes that ladder and this rope over here and he, goes up there and he said, he leans that ladder up over the house like that. Can't you imagine uh, them people standing around outside saying, what in the world? Listen, you know what them boys had? They had determination. I'm going to tell you something, Sunday school teacher. Don't you get discouraged. Bus worker, was you bust down this morning? Don't you get discouraged. You say, Bless the Lord. I'm going to go back next weekend and I'm going to hit it even harder. That's what I do preaching. I've been preaching a long time. And sometimes it feels like I'm hollering at a brick wall. And sometimes I feel like just giving up on Sunday night or Monday morning. But there's something down inside that said, get back up there and hit it again. And boy, if you just keep a hitting it and keep a hitting it and keep a hitting it, finally the light will break through. Oh, the sun will shine. The soul of me say, I'm telling you, we need some determination. My 11th, when I was in 11th grade in high school, we played the district championship in basketball, uh, and we got beat. And we got beat by like two or three points, and I'm telling you, it like to kill me. Because our school had never been to the state playoff. We went my senior year. 
and we was in the gym, the little Nebo gym, after the game, the lights was out. And I was in there shooting around like that with the lights out because you could barely see. And somebody come by and said, Danny, the season's over. What are you doing in here? And I said, I'm getting ready for next year. And they said, oh, starting early. I said, yeah. And you know what? I've thought about that a lot of times. Don't ever say, I'm burnt out. I'm on a vacation for a while. I'm just going to get out of the bus for a while. I've worked it long enough. Don't get like, you know what? That's the devil cheating you. You get right back up the next day and hit it again. If you want God to bless you. Amen? Don't you ever say, well, I've read my Bible, read my Bible. It just don't work out. I've prayed and nothing good happens. I'm just going to quit it for a while. That's the biggest mistake you'll ever make in your life. Determination says, we're going to get him in there one way or another. There's more than one way to get a man in to hear Jesus. And so they slung that ladder up against that house, and they started climbing it and took that rope and started pulling him up like that. And them Pharisees out there said, that's unconventional. They're using gimmicks. They're bribing people to come. You should just pray and let the Lord draw them in. He's able to touch that man when he wants to. You're taking the guns. And they said... You know, they just look so good, and they just, you know, blah. You know and, uh, and they're just so perfect and never done nothing wrong. And they're just sitting there like this, you know. Ooh, God, our fault. Like that, you know. I've been screaming for several uh, days, so I can't do it. But they're sitting there like this. And, and the Lord's preaching. And about that time, a little piece of straw goes. And here comes a little They made roots out of stuff like that back then. A little piece, a twig, or a leaf, and started following everybody. Went. And here, and then about that time, a little hole broke out. A fair and there's daylight. And by this time, everybody in there, I mean, you didn't want to just stare up and say, "Oh my son, what in the world going on?" So, and there's, and then they saw hands pulling out tile of the roof. And by this, the Lord just kept right on preaching, "I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except by me." Stuff falling all around here. Sky opening up. And boy, a big old hole opening up like that right there. And boy, about that time, when there's a hole opened up and a bed come floating down. Through the, think about that. I mean, here's this bed comes floating down through the ceiling like this. What if I was up here preaching tonight and all of a sudden a bed with a man laying on it come floating down out of, the, out of that room? That'd be cool. I, I'm saying that would be something, wouldn't it? And boy, the Lord didn't bother him one bit. I mean, them Pharisees back there saying, what are they doing? What are they doing? I, I, and boy, I'm you, they couldn't believe what was going on. That fellow just like an angel from heaven floated right down and landed right there in the floor. And everybody says, I can't believe this. This is disrespect. I can't believe what he's doing here. And the Lord stopped everything. He said, everybody be quiet, son. And he had him boy lay in front of him. And he said, your sins be forgiven. And everybody went, Whoa! Who is that? What did he say? He said, your sin be forgiven. So the Lord said this. Now the Lord showed up there. The Lord's showing you that He always puts your sins being forgiven ahead of the healing of your body. There's a lot of preachers and a lot of ministry. All their ministry is is healing bodies, healing bodies, healing bodies. God puts more emphasis on your sins being forgiven than He does your body being healed. Because when your body gets healed, it's going to die of something anyway. So your sins being forgiven comes first. And then everybody said, wow, who does he think he is? He said, I figured you'd say that. Just because you wondering, rise up and walk. And when he did, his ankles got strong, his arms got strong. He jumped up, jumped up, and he rolled up his bed. He, he carried his bed, and he went down the aisle. You can walk now. And he went down the aisle and said, excuse me, excuse me. Excuse me, excuse me, come on down the aisle. And went out, come on. And the Partridge family was born. 
and, 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 the, and the Brady Bunch. And, and that's how I got started. That's right, brother. That's how it all got started. You know why? And boy, I'll tell you what, out of sight, out of sight. Nobody didn't know it. No doubt any kind of glory. Nobody, they didn't, it was out of sight. They were in the spotlight. No, no, Jesus made a miracle there. He healed that boy. But what the people did not see behind the scenes, up on the roof was four old boys, faith, compassion, works, and determination, waving their hands saying, Glory to God, thank you, Jesus. He made it in. He made it in. Sit down, fellas. You know why? Because compassion said, my heart goes out to him. Faith said, Jesus can help him. Work said, let's take him. And determination said, we ain't giving up till we get into God. I'll never forget, I told you this story, I believe, once before. Many of y'all know. I've seen a lot of people get saved. I've told you about Tater Sheehan and others. And I'll never forget the story of J.D. Ward. J.D. Ward lived in Marion. How many of y'all knew J.D.? Raise your hand. Oh, about half the church here tonight. J.D. was a big old rough logging, logger man. I mean, stout as an ox. Old J.D., his wife Sherry came to our church and got saved at New Manor. And, and Sherry got saved, and one time... At the time, and this was way back in the mid-80s, early 80s, there was 19 women in our church whose husbands wasn't saved. 19 women. And them 19 women all got together and they said, we'll start getting together, I think on two nights or something, and we're going to pray for our husbands. And they got under a bird, and Brother Sean, them women got together every Tuesday night and prayed for their husbands. And I mean, they bought, it wasn't a gossip session. They didn't get together and just run their mouth. They got all across the altar and bawled their mouth. And they said, God, save my husband. God, please save my husband. I don't want him to go to hell. I don't want him to burn. I don't want my husband. And that brother, they got God's attention. We on, we'd go over and visit me. And people would witness to him. Oh, J.D., he's tough. He wasn't disrespectful or nothing. But he just hardened sinners. I guess at that time, J.D. was probably about 30 years old. I don't know. Maybe not even that old. And J.D., I went over and witnessed to him one night on a, things on a Monday night. And me and somebody from the church went and knocked on his door. And they let us in. Sherry said, hey, Brother Danny, how are you? And me and somebody, we sat down there, and I took the Bible, and I said, J.D., do you know the Lord loves you? He said, he's watching football games. He loved football and basketball. We played ball with Bobby, we and him, Bobby. And him. We played basketball all the time. And, and, and uh, J.D. loved football, any kind of sport. And he'd sit there and he'd watch that ball game. And I said, J.D., you know the Lord loves you. You want to get saved? And he'd just look at me like that and look at that football game. He wasn't hateful. But he just is like no response. And I witnessed and I begged and I pled with him. And I said, J.D., if I prayed with you right now, if we got down right now, would you ask the Lord? And he just looked down like that. He wouldn't say yes, wouldn't say no. I said, J.D., right now, if we get down in the floor, we ask God to forgive you right now of all your sins and save you. And he just looked at the floor. He never would say yes, he never say no. And finally, I thought, I don't know what else to do. I said, well, let me have a word of prayer. And I prayed. And I shook his hand and I left. I said, I'll be praying for you. That was on Monday. We prayed Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. See, compassion, faith, works. That Sunday morning, I had to go preach in Virginia. Almost, I believe it was in Virginia. And I drove that morning. I remember it snowed that morning. And I was driving in the snow and I was praying that God would do a great work in our church day. My goodness, that's been a long time ago. And I'll never forget going to that little church way up there in the mountains. It snow was a-falling. It was cold. And I left about 5.30 in the morning. I hardly ever left on Sunday morning, but I let this preacher talk me into coming up there, and I went up there and preached. 
That Sunday I got home about 2 o'clock. And I lived in that little old bitty house over there in Nebo. And it was Carrie was just about three years old maybe. Before. And I remember that day I come home and I had such a burden for J.D. I couldn't get him off my heart. I could, couldn't get him off my mind. I just couldn't do it. And I remember always, you know, on Sunday evening you want down and take a nap. Especially I got up about 5.30 that morning. And I got down in the living room floor and it was so cold. And I prayed and I prayed and I said, Dear God, please get a hold of J.D. Please, Lord, I can't think of I couldn't think of nothing else but that man. We had a little old oil, Siegler oil heater. The house was cold. And I remember getting down in the floor and my feet up against that where the hot air would blow out and keep my feet warm. And I prayed in the living room floor. And every time I started getting speak, I just gripped my teeth and wouldn't let myself go to sleep. And I said, God, I'm not going to sleep. Pray, God, I please, please, God, please, God, get a hold of it. And I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. It got 3 o'clock. It got 4 o'clock. It got 5 o'clock. It got 6 o'clock. And I prayed all evening. Got ready for church. We had church at 7, man. We got up in the prayer room before church. A gang of men stood around in the circle. And I said, y'all pray. Pray. We prayed. We come down in the Sunday night service. And somebody said, Brother Danny, Look, he's here. And J.D. was sitting way over here against the wall near near the back, about right in here. We had an aisle over there like that. And he's right in there. And there he sat. And my heart jumped. And I said, glory to God. Hallelujah. I'll never forget that night I preached on Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And I was tired, but I the best I could. And I preached my heart out. And I said... This may be the last chance you ever get. We stood. I said, let's have the invitation. That night, there's a few people come here, a few people come there, and all of a sudden, I heard something over here on this side of the church. Something went, woo! Like that. I heard people screaming. I heard people crying. I look, and down the aisle come that big old log, and boy, there's arms about that big around. Here come J.D. Sherry behind him, just a squalling. And boy, everybody going, and everybody started bawling. The whole church started crying. And I remember, I'm telling you what, Brother Heaven came down, and glory filled our soul. And J.D. got saved. He got born again. And I'm tell, I tell you, I had a spell. We all had a shouting time. God saved J.D that night and the glory come down somebody had compassion somebody had faith somebody had works and somebody was determined J.D. lived for God and never missed a service became one of my best members never missed a service you know where New Man of Christian School is he cleared that land that chainsaw out there all by himself cut them trees and I was preaching in Maryland. And I preached a revival up in Maryland near Washington, D.C. And they called me and said, Danny J.D. is cutting, cutting a tree. And a big limb come out and hit him in the back of the head and crushed his skull. And Sherry said, Danny, he's in intensive care. And said, he's not going to live. She said, they told me he can't live. Said his brain smashed. They're just keeping him alive by machine. She said, what should I do? I said, well, just let him go, Sherry. She said, well, I ain't going to let him go till you get here. And I said, well, I'll be home married. I think it was Saturday evening I come home. Went to the hospital. That night we stood in that hospital. You know, the Lord's done that a lot to me while I've been preaching 30 years. He really has. I've been preaching on trains before and a train will go by just like that. You better some you better listen. And buddy, I'm telling you, I went in that hospital that night and that day, and there was my buddy. You couldn't, his head was so swelled up, you couldn't even tell it was him. And she said, Brother Danny, what are we going to do? I said, Well, sure, you just let him go. And we had a word of prayer and then unplugged him. 
His body's jerked a few times in there. Oh, J.D.'s in heaven tonight. He's looking down tonight. She's probably saying, Come on, Brother Danny. Preach harder than that is not the best you can do. I'm sorry if I let you down, J.D. But I'm trying to tell you people here something tonight. We need a dose of that again. We need a dose of that again of just compassion, determination. Now everybody here knows somebody's not saved. Everybody here knows somebody that needs the Lord. I'm begging us. We've got five big Sundays coming up starting next Sunday. We need to get old-fashioned burden and compassion and faith and works and determination to get people to God. Let's stand by our head for prayer. Get us a song.